Very good. Always is, though. Always is with you, Laurel. Again, we're uh, welcoming Laurel Flutterbush back to the, um, you know, the studio. Thank you very much. Um, she's a Ann Arbor-based uh, harpist that comes all this way every time she comes up here, and just amuse. Uh, just as amazing talent, and I'm um, always glad to see her in the t uh, studio. Always glad to be here. Yeah. Now that piece was. Um, yeah. Um, either cockles and mussels or sweet Molly Malone. Malone. Um, yeah. Those are, it's both the same song though, just slightly different title. Um, yeah. It's a. Irish folk song in honor of St. Patrick's Day, of course. And thus, you're also a reason why you're dressed in the green uh, uh, jacket. And, <laughs> and you know, as, as I was telling you, um, I had heard that um, blue is actually the national color of Ireland. Someone told me that, but I guess green is what we traditionally think of. And as you said, um, for the Protestants, it's probably orange. So there's like three different colors to choose from, but I, I picked green. <laughs> well, I could too. I was like, uh, my friend was visit Ireland, and she said that. Um, she goes, if you're looking at the colors, it's green, and we would consider it orange, but you got to say gold there because that depicts gold, not oh, orange. Okay. Oh, you I know, that's know. like, well, you know, in the, in the flag, it's, it looks like orange to us, but they consider that gold. So you got to oh, say gold, okay. otherwise you're offended. So. <laughs> Sounds more prestigious that way. <laughs> no, it's like, uh, I guess uh, one time I did, I was reading somewhere, the Irish seems to be a very large ethnic population in this country, and um, they listed a bunch of people who would, Surprisingly, they have Irish roots, and including Martin Luther King had Irish ancestry as well. Oh, okay. So, I mean, so there seems like it's another thing, too, I think a lot of people will identify with the music of the I Ireland is because it was, you know, rooted in some pain, some misery of being colonized and being brutalized by, you know, Britain. And, you know, you know, it's like that's, it seems that the harp is like also the symbol, one of the symbols of Ireland. Mm -hmm. It's also, I was just thinking that today before you came here, it was like, um, the harps all over the world. I mean, there's several types of harps, and this is a beautiful, the type that they would use in, you know, uh, playing concerts at major major venues, like Whiting. And you <laughs> yeah. also came up, the first time you came up, I think you had a smaller one. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't have that anymore, but there are a couple of them. I, I used to have a couple of little lap harps, so that would be like a, a very small size harp. And then there's some, like, medium size, like, that might stand on the floor about that high. Uh, those are all. Those are both varieties of Celtic harps. Those are closer to what you would actually see in ancient Ireland with the troubadours, and um, the national symbol of Ireland would be that kind of a harp. No, not this kind. No. Even though this is related. This is really a beautiful. It's a beautiful instrument. I mean, some people can just impress people having it sitting in their living room, <laughs> but uh, and you, but you know, I actually play the thing. So. <laughs> No, it's like, um, we've covered this before in past shows, but I mean, it is kind of an unusual instrument for a person to get involved with, and you were doing it from an early age. Um, it seems intimidating. I think that would be a very daunting instrument to undertake learning how to play. Yeah, I might have mentioned this on one of, the, one of your shows, but when my, I, I wanted to play the harp, and then when my parents first surprised me with a harp, it was smaller than this one, but still it was bigger than I was, and it was sort of covered up, so there was this just sort of the shape of this harp looming in my bedroom and, and I, I started crying like I was kind of afraid of it even though I had wanted it. You know, suddenly it looked kind of like a monster. But, <laughs> but I, luckily I, I got over my fear of it and I, I started playing and I, I haven't regretted it. And definitely I can test you have to be, this kind of keeps you in shape. This thing is quite heavy. It's 70, 80 pounds, right? This one's 70, 70. pounds, but some, some way 80 or more, yeah. Yeah, you definitely have a, you have a, you know, you have an ordeal to go through unloading and loading every place you've got to go to, so you yeah, have you to plan that out. You were very nice about helping me get it down the stairs yeah. here, and that wasn't so easy, you know, so stairs are a challenge, but otherwise I can wheel it around on my dolly. No, anyway, uh, you've been um, playing hard for all over the place. I mean, I see you posting on Facebook um, that you're playing at different venues, like coffee shops, at different... Uh, Different types of um, restaurants have had you in there. It's the churches you've played at. Different yeah, weddings a lot. <laughs> weddings too? Right. Yeah, that's... I don't post the weddings because they're private events. But right. But that's one of the main things I do, weddings and receptions. And well, that's understandable. Yeah. I mean, that would be a... I, my friend had a um, wedding, and his, at his wedding, it was at a church here locally, but they actually had a, a uh, string quartet. And I thought that was a classy 
very elegant and the music was great. I mean, it was music, and I was like, I really, I never seen anybody have that actually. They kind of raised the bar for me in opinion of having what you want to have at a wedding. So. Yeah, people can have all, all different kinds of things, and sometimes they play with a flutist. That's the most popular combination. But once in a while, violin or flute and violin. So there are all different possibilities. Now I always love hearing the the harp. It's just um, and you have um. You've always amazed me because you're always so. She goes, she travels probably what two or three states to different venues <laughs> and different events and different. Yeah, mostly um, Michigan, but once I played with the International Symphony, which um, is based in Port Huron and Sarnia, Ontario. So, one of the concerts I did earlier this month was in Sarnia, Ontario, across the border, and once in a while I play in Ohio, and um, yeah, I, I, I think. Um, Mostly Michigan, but once in a while, I go expand it a little bit, the range. We'd definitely like to make you the most sought-after uh, harpist in um, uh, Michigan. That's our aim, because I, and I definitely show you, you have an enthusiasm, I think, that a lot of people really find quite, you know, quite, you know, quite you know, intriguing, because you seem so happy when you're playing the harp. I mean, oh, yes, I am, for sure. Do you, how many hours do you, do you actually play that a lot at home, the practice, or? Uh, somewhat, uh, oh, I, I guess... It, it, it varies a lot. Like a lot of the activities I do that are harp related aren't just me sitting there practicing. Like I do a lot of things with scheduling my harp jobs or sending out demo CDs or calling clients or there are a lot of things that are related to harp that aren't actually playing the harp. And then also markings. Like if I get an orchestra part, I have to put a lot of harp markings in the score to make it, or in my part to make it playable. And um, so that takes up a lot of time. So, so the actual playing the harp isn't, that's one of the things I do, but it's not the only thing. So. And you have a degree in music, obviously, in fine arts. Yes, or not fine arts. It's actually a bachelor. Or, or, well, I got my bachelor's in Toronto. I got my master's and doctorate at the University of Michigan. It's a doctor of musical arts degree. Wow. So that's like, you know, you know your stuff. Oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so and um, no, it's just... Um, Every time you come in, it's like, uh, I'm just, I find more about the harp that I, you know, I have to ask and we cover because it's, it's kind of an instrument, and guitars are in a lot of households. I mean, I wouldn't even want to estimate how many harps are in America, I mean, it would be so low, the harps in America, I mean, but they do just seem to be kind of enjoying a, a birth, a rebirth and um, the appeal and uh, popularity, because if you go to the Ren festivals, the Renaissance festivals and the medieval fairs and stuff, they seem to have some there's some crafter of them or some seller of them. Mm -hmm. Somebody's playing one of them or at right. least somewhere in the corner of the, the complex, you know. Yeah. And then the, there's this pop band of Florence and the Machine, and I'm seeing that they have a harpist as one of their um, band members. So there are things like that. And a few years ago, it was um, Andreas Bollenweider um, who, who played an electronic harp. So once in a while you see harpists, um, you know, in the pop culture that help popularize it. And then of course there was Harpo Marx. So, so um, yeah, and, and then there's the whole, as you were saying, the Renaissance, Renaissance idea, people who are interested in folk music or um, Renaissance things, or art fairs, sometimes there are people selling, selling little folk harps, so. So the, this kind of wood is, what do you, was it maple, is it? This has a maple finish. Yeah. Um, there are all different kinds of, um, styles of, of harps you can get like they're you know walnut or ebony wood or one of my harps um i have a zebra wood which is exotic wood from africa and um some of them are more modern design this one's kind of traditional looking some might be gold finished so they're all different kinds of harps now the, the part of the harp that comes down where you're at right there by your shoulder there what is that called that that but it's not like the board right that's a board does that have a <laughs> Testing my, I, I, you play I, the thing. I actually know surprisingly little about harp construction stuff. Um, this is the soundboard that that vibrates. Right. I think this is the body of the harp. The, I think this part, and the neck would be this curved part, and that would be the column. This. Yeah, that looks like a column. It looks almost like a column that would be in a building. Yeah, the, the, the base is down there. Yeah, yeah, and you also have the pedals on, which we can't see because right. I don't have the I don't have the camera angle covered on that. But uh, there's also pedals on, and there's how many harp pedals on there? This, um, the pedal harps have seven pedals, and th that would be one difference between this kind of harp and the kind that the troubadours would play in Ireland. Um, the, the, the folk harps don't have pedals. They either have levers that you would move with your f fingers to, to make the notes um, 
sharp or flat, um, but or else they would have nothing, or you you know you you wouldn't be able to change it from um, natural to sharp, for example. But on the, on the pedal harp, you use pedals to do that. Um, that makes the pitch higher or lower. Like right now, all the D strings are D flat because I have the pedal in the up position. If I move the pedal to the middle position, all the Ds become D natural, and they become D sharp if I put them in the lowest position. And there's seven pedals, like there's one for A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And, um, hey, I wish I could have yeah. some uh, camera angle to see that, because <laughs> right. that's intriguing, because uh, it's so much like a, a similar on a piano in some ways. Yeah, that's right. And I, the piano was basically taken off the harp. I mean, you know, taken, and they just basically laid it on the <laughs> side and put the uh, the hammered, there's like little hammers inside of a piano in case mm -hmm. somebody hasn't ever looked and lifted up the thing and seen it. There's like little hammers, but they're all like velvet, not velvet, um, they're uh, felt covered, I think they are, aren't they, to strike okay. the keys? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't. I, I know that there are hammers that strike it. I'm not sure exactly what the construction is, but also on the piano, one difference is each note on the piano. I think is three different strings. Like the, they have three strings that are hammered together and vibrate together, but on the harp, um, each note is just one string. So anyway, um, well, let's see. I know the people are watching. They some people are going to be boring with the going into the <laughs> terminology and nomenclature oh, of yes. their <laughs> harp. So maybe we'll get back to have you play sure. another uh, piece. And well, what are you planning on playing there? Okay, this is another Irish folk song. This is Minstrel Boy. Okay. Very good. Um, and it, was, it seems like the harp and uh, like a lot of other instruments, but I think string instruments and horn in, you know, horns have a, the ability to actually bring forth a lot of emotion more you know, quickly than some other forms. I mean, so certainly the synthesizers. I mean, but the song itself you just played, I just, uh, there's like mental images popping in my head without even closing my eyes. There's like, you know, scenes from Ireland. Of course, you know it was an Irish song, but I mean, it just does seem to kind of, it does seem to kind of lend itself to the, the scenery to the imagery of Ireland, you know? Yeah, I actually don't know the specific story of, of this tune, but um, even though it's a kind of simple tune, it, it, it seems, at least to me, it strikes me as having some emotional depth, like you were saying, because, well, for one thing, it has kind of interesting chords. It has, like, even though it's in C major, um, it, has, it has, has A minor and A minor in the middle part. And minor chords tend to be a little bit sad or melancholy, so it seems like there's some, you know, it's not just a happy-go-lucky song as far as I'm concerned. No, I definitely didn't get that image, and I didn't know much about the history of that song. So, I mean, with the imagery I got, it's kind of like kind of a sad, melancholy feeling yeah. towards it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, I just think that the, uh, the harp, and um, it just has the quality to do that. I mean, in certain churches, I don't know if you knew this or not, but... Uh, like the pre the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, there is such a thing. The Orthodox Presbyterian Church, okay. they they don't s sing or have musical instruments other than the uh, from the Book of Psalms, and the only accompaniment they allow for that is the harp. 
And okay. so it's like um, it's a real rigid, uh, uh, sec, you know, sect of the uh, the uh, Presbyterian denominations. But it's like, uh, and I was always tempted. There was a church, I guess, it was supposed to be in the Metamora area that um, it was an Orthodox Presbyterian church. Okay, and yeah, I go to Ortho. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't go to that, that church, but I go to a conservative synagogue, and it's kind of a similar um, thing. They don't have. Um, musical instruments in the conservative synagogue. There's some, I guess the Reformed um, temple would have it, but they have religious, I guess, since the destruction of the temples, yeah. you, you, know, you don't have... There was a change in the way that the, the Jewish people worshipped. Mm -hmm. That's why I've always told or read that after the destruction of the temple, the synagogues are centers of learning, but it wasn't really considered a full-fledged place of worship, or wasn't, the worship had changed its way of being done, you know, because right. of that. So, I mean, but I do, I think that's like, uh, I personally think there are a lot of times the, um, a lot of churches have gotten too far to uh, try to be entertainment. And there's like, no, I like to be able, when I go to church, I want to be able to walk away from the outside world and go to someplace feel different. It gives you, you know, this basically, it gives you that time to mental part when you walk through the door. And I, I would, I would encourage, a, you know, church to stay away from the, you know, loud rock, rock and roll guitar. <laughs> I know they want to appeal to the, the youth crowd or whatever, but. I never really liked that even as a youth, you know, when I was younger. I really didn't care for that kind of a worship, form of worship. You know, I just <laughs> thought it was too too rock and rollish. you know. Well, I guess a lot of churches have, like, a few different kinds of services, or, or at least a couple. Like, often they'll have a more traditional service, and then maybe later they'll have a, a more rock instrument. So they try to appeal to different people who want different things in worship. So I, I guess um, different people do things differently but yeah that there are different trends in, in religious music i know that hmm. not if i answer asked you this before in the journal we've had like three or four conversations online but uh did we ever uh discover um what was the most unusual event you were part of <laughs> uh, i don't know i mentioned uh, i played once on a, a moving boat there was a wedding and they they had it on a moving ferry boat so i <laughs> played the harp on that um say so I'm not. I played in pubs for St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> not too often, but um, there was some guy who had who had a pub. That he wanted me to entertain that, so I played tunes there. Um, yeah, I played the memorial services, at, and I think my yeah. Speaking of Irish, um, at, at this one memorial service, they wanted very festive Irish tunes because the grandfather who had, was deceased liked that kind of music, and at first I really had trouble believing they would want these festive, upbeat tunes at his memorial, but, but they did. So, um, I, I, you know, that's what I played, and it, it went over okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, I guess memorial services can be different depending on what the people want or what the deceased person would have wanted. According to one English teacher I had, and she did, uh, when she gave a lecture, basically, we covered some of the subject of, you know, where, I mean, whatever the literature that we were studying at the time, but she also gives so much of background, and her name was uh, Dr. Uh, Coleman, she taught at U of M Flint, and uh, she talked about the Irish wakes. And um, all I can say is, if a person who knows the history of it, the Irish wakes could become a quite raucous affairs. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's like uh, it's like I don't want to go into full details, but they're kind of be. Right. You just want to put. You just want typically when you talk about grieving, you want to imagine some of the things that are going on would be associated with grieving. But their view is that life goes on, and you have to embrace that impulse, the the natural, the life impulse. And so I mean. It's quite, you know, there is a sadness to it, but then again, there's a kind of a, it's kind of tempered with like a buoyancy for, you know, there's love for life, this lust for mm -hmm. life. So, I mean, she was, she went into full detail, and it was a quite, you know, it gives you quite a different perspective of what different cultures and how they do all death. I mean, you know, I'm from a Anglo, I mean, I'm a, as from so much of a mixture group. I got so many different ethnic groups mixed in there, but basically my family was not very, a group of people that actually got too morose during um, funerals. There's a somberness, but not a moroseness, not like a, you know, like a, uh, a um, overarching pessimistic viewpoint, which is weird because I personally am a pessimist myself, but, <laughs> but um, it just, it was like, it, it never, um, it never got so like, you didn't hear weeping and wailing at my, the funerals of my family. I mean, both sides of the family were basically, there was a sadness, but it was always kind of, um, you know, kind of a celebration of the person's life. And I always, I always respected that about my family looking back that they didn't go get succumb to being just so grief-stricken. You know, I always liked that. I mean, it, they had this buoyancy of spirit. 
and I like that. So anyway, that's a personal note. But uh, yeah. but uh, uh, now when, what kind of uh, what kind of venue would you love to play in? I mean, you haven't played at. <laughs> well, I, I I tend to like the th one thing I like about being a freelance musician is that uh, I get to play in a lot of different places, and you never get like in a rut from just doing one thing. Like there's some harpists who only play in orchestras or only play in an opera company or only play in a coffee house or and and I guess I, I do a lot of these like I, I do those things but, but you know I do all those things and I, I do other events also so it's kind of nice because there's some variety and um, each each one I do I try to um, you know I get very involved in what I'm doing at the time so um, you know each each um, performance is kind of like its own world <laughs> so yeah, I, I just think that's a, um, I just think you live an interesting life because you just, um, you know, what is it like? I mean, to be a musician, you're, you're a professional musician. I mean, you don't have, I mean, from my knowledge, you don't have a job like it's a nine to five thing that you, you kind of fit this into. This is what you do. Yeah, that's right. I, I also teach some private students. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's, um, it's actually the only um I'm, well, I, I babysat when I was a <laughs> much younger. <laughs> and, um, I work at the polls at election time um, as a poll worker, but this is really, um, I'd say I guess I, I've done a little stint in restaurant work, which I was no good at, <laughs> but this is um, pretty much the only job I've ever done. Um, so I don't really have very much to compare it to. It's not like I used to, you know, have a nine to five job and then went to this or something. It's pretty much the only thing I've known. So um, I guess I'm used to having it be kind of, having a job where it's kind of very flexible hours or um, like, I mean, in some ways that's sort of very leisurely, like, I, you know, I can sometimes get up at 11 if I want or something like that, but then I might also be working till late at night or, or filling out a contract late at night or something like that. So it's not like I'm just um, goofing off, even though it's very flexible hours. Now you are represented by Rush Entertainment, and that's, yeah, that's and, and that's out of Detroit area. They're actually Freeland, which Pre is um, near Midland. I, I okay. Guess be Saginaw Midland area. And it's like, you know, how many years have you been with uh, this agency? <laughs> oh, a long time, probably between twenty and thirty years. I think I'm not sure exactly. Wow, I mean, so they and um, it's it, to me, it's like it intrigues me that you know, like when I talk to writers, I talk to um, painters, I talk to um, sculptors. That, um, you know, I, I'm t always been connected to the artistic community because, you know, Flint's got a lot of artistic things going on. I mean, you know, people want to badmouth it. It's got a bad <laughs> reputation. But I think you're aware of, you know, how, because even though you're from Ann Arbor area, we do have quite an active arts community, music community. Oh, yeah. And I've, But I've always been surprised at how many people, a lot of the guys I knew who were in bands had to do the 9 to 5 job somewhere or do, the, do something else. They always kind of, between gigs, they were doing something else. And... Uh, a lot of them complained about it. A lot of people just accepted, especially living in Flint, especially as the economy got worse, you know, the jobs left. Uh, but there, one time, there was a lot of money here, and people used to buy all the best instruments, and they used to be able to buy the newest technology every time it came down the road. But the artistic personality basically is kind of living something outside the norm, outside of the everyday cycle <laughs> of what most people go through. They have to get up at a certain time, go to a job at a certain time. Right. And, and in some ways, there's more discipline required to be an art artist. You, because you have to produce, you have to push yourself to produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and it's it's a little bit of a paradox. I, I don't quite know how to reconcile a lot of. Um, I mean, not, it's not representative of all artists, but like a lot of the musicians. Well, I think particularly rock musicians, but I think also maybe some classical people may maybe are not the most disciplined people in a lot of ways. Like they might have wild mood swings, or some of them have been known to, you know, to be you know drawn to excess in terms of maybe drinking or drug use or th you know, unfortunately things like that but then often when it comes to their art you know their music they are very disciplined and um, I'm not quite sure how that how that that works it seems like a contradiction but it seems to often be the case but not me of course you know I'm, <laughs> I'm very disciplined and wholesome in my life so but it is kind of um you you associate with a lot of people who are artists um, yeah. um people who are musicians mm -hmm. um that gives you a different perspective of life. I mean, it. In some ways, after a while, and you've been, you know, you've been at this for a long time. 
um, not saying you know, not saying you're old, but you know, <laughs> but it's like you've been at this yeah. for a long time, and uh, you're a, a seasoned veteran in this. It, it does give you a different perspective. It does kind of probably. Do you ever feel like you're like uh, the odd person out? You know, and you hear other people's <laughs> conversations or. Yeah, yeah, that, that is, I mean, my life, I guess, is kind of idios, idiosyncratic. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but it's, you know, it often doesn't fit neatly into this category or that category. It's kind of like I'm, I'm doing my own thing, and <laughs> in some ways it might be related to what other people are doing, but often it seems like it's, you know, not very related, or totally unrelated. Now, you come from an artistically inclined, musically inclined family, don't you? Um, yeah, my mom is is a very good pianist. She plays by ear, which is, is, a, is a good influence on me, and I sometimes play with her, and um, that gives me practice at playing by ear, which I was not trained to do, so I've had to um, work on that. And, um, my, and my dad um, didn't play an instrument, except when he was a kid he played the piano, but he was always a very um, big music lover. Like he, he had the radio on, and he would take us to concerts and things like that, so both my parents were I'm very interested in music. No, see, I, I, I think that's, you know, that's the key. I mean, even if you're not good at something yourself, try to, you know, cultivate that in your children. I mean, uh, let them go and talk to people and maybe set them at the feet of these people, you know, who are, you know, well-versed in, like, um, music or sculpting or painting, whatever. I mean, no, do you also do any of like, artistic stuff other than, I mean... I write. I'm not a professional writer, but I've done a lot of writing over my life and the... Um, yeah, I've written like poems or, or short stories or, you know, longer works, um, and it's it's mainly something I, I do for for pleasure for you know. But yeah, I, I guess that's that's my main outlet besides playing the harp is writing. So. so you say you're a multifaceted artistic person. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it does seem to do that. Some people like um, like Kurt Vonnegut was a writer. He also did these cartoonish kind of drawings but they're really entertaining they're interesting i don't know if you've ever seen some of his sketches no i haven't they know john lennon did yeah and then uh, also anthony um burgess uh he also had some kind of he did some art you know little sketches and he also did some uh you know he's a great writer and he's also a music a musicologist and a musician his own right um mm -hmm. it's like he's quite interesting matter of fact it's the book clockwork orange which he's best known for is probably one of the books that I would say I liked the least of his, but I mean, he had such a, he had so many things, so many irons in the fire, so many, so many things and disciplines he was part of, that I always find that intriguing, that um, it seems one does help bolster the other, or one gives rise to the need to st pursue another. Right, yeah. So. I think I've more often heard of music being tied with visual art, but for me it's more like um, literary art. So. Right. I, I just think it's like, and I, you know, we covered this before. I mean, uh, my parents are like, well, my dad was a blue collar worker. He, my dad worked at the, at the post office. He loaded and unloaded trucks every day, but he had an artistic uh, bent. He was very, um, he was very musical and uh, he didn't get the encouragement from his family that he should have probably. So he didn't really pursue that as a full time thing. But he and my mom both um, encouraged us to do as much artistic stuff and our, you know, musical. I was just, I didn't have the discipline to follow through <laughs> on the music. Sorry, dad. But, um, <laughs> But uh, my mom was a kind of a craft person, you know, crafts, and she also did some, she also, she had bad arthritis and she also had bad eyesight towards the end, so she couldn't pursue those any longer. And I think that might have been one of the reasons why she gave, basic, the re, one of some of the reasons why she basically gave up on herself. Oh, because she could pursue that. Yeah. And I mean, no, do you find yourself like, uh, when you're listening to music on the radio, and I know you listen to radio, because you seem to be, it seemed like a person playing a harp would be kind of a, a music snob, but I found just the opposite with you. I mean, you know quite a bit about the pop culture. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, a lot of musicians do like a wide variety of musical styles, but then there are other musicians who are only classical music, or, and, and then some people would have, I guess maybe what I would consider a prejudice against other styles of music, like, um, you know, thinking that jazz music is um, is no good or, you know, rock music is no good or something like that. But I, I guess I tend to, I, I, I listen to a wide variety of things. I mean, I know there are other people who listen to a wider variety of things than I do. Some people might listen to a, a whole lot of world music and, you know, I, once in a while I listen to world music, but I guess mostly it's uh, more... <laughs> more of the kinds of music that you commonly hear in America. Well, again, speaking of music, well, um, if you have another piece in mind, I'd like sure. to hear it. I think everybody else would, too. Oh, sorry. I just have to my pen. OK, 
Okay, well, since spring is coming, I thought I'd play a piece by um, Antonio Vivaldi. This is from his Four Seasons. This is spring. That was really great. It just had a, that is that song's got just a kind of a mental image that comes up as a very cheerful. Of course, you give a little bit of a, you know, kind of a good build up on that song. Yeah. But yeah, that's also when they sometimes do at weddings for processional. Sometimes brides want something other than here comes the bride, or else for the bridesmaids. Sometimes I've done that. Yeah, just a very cheery kind of upbeat song, and now it's like. Um, now, do you are are there people? I never thought about this. Are there composers who still write pieces, per, you know, predominantly for the harp? <laughs> well, me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are the the most famous composers for harp. I think are probably deceased. Like Carlos Salzedo was a big harp composer and pioneer of harp technique, and Marcel Grangeny, and um, Probably, you know, there are some other older ones, you know, like from, I think the 1700s was Naderman, or there's um, Dushek, there's, those are more, you know, older ones. So there, there are, I'm sure there are current ones who, who write for harp, but I'm not so familiar with, with them. You know, it's like, um, I've always been amazed with people who study music, you know, especially they go to like an, a conservatory or whatever. They almost have to learn other languages to get through the names of the people who are composers yeah. <laughs> before them. Oh, that's, that's for sure, now, yeah. So, like I said, you're uh, through. You, they, people can book you through Rush Entertainment. That's R U S C H Entertainment, and um, the number here is. Um, there's several numbers here, but we'll get the one Saginaw and Flint nine eight nine seven eight one, fifteen fifty three. The one in Saginaw, the one in Flint's number is eight one zero two three five fifty seven hundred. Also, you can find it on, on the internet at www.rushrushentertainment.com. Anyway, um. Well, I was gonna say, Don, this gonna this coming week or so, you're gonna be probably all over the place for the St. Patty's Day celebrations. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be on a, another station. I don't know if you mentioned, but but yeah, I'm gonna be doing that, and and also playing in the Jackson Symphony. Oh, sorry, you, we have a concert. You so could I be on the Tom Sumner show soon. Yeah, that's right. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we've talked. Yeah, about I that. didn't know if I was. Allowed no, to that's fine. Um, Tom, we um. <laughs> Tom and I, uh, Tom and us, we, uh, Tom and we work together quite a bit on stuff. We oh, actually nice. send people, to, you know, guests, potential guests to each other because yeah, you're both nice guys. <laughs> it's real, well, Tom's an excellent interviewer, and I, I think that if he, um, if anybody, I, especially we're our purpose of Flint Talk Radio is not we're not a money making outfit. I mean, if we that's what our intention was, we've failed miserably in that. But <laughs> haven't we all? <laughs> <laughs> it's like if we wouldn't be in the basement of a, of a house on the east side of Flint <laughs> if we were actually a financial success, but. Uh, 
it's like a, a talent in and around Flint, as Tom Summer would say, is probably as good as you'll find anywhere else in the country, maybe the world. And um, we definitely we definitely hold that view as well. Um, you never know who you're going to run into in this area. And there's some amazing gems being hidden around here. Um, the, I can't emphasize enough because the news is accurate when they talk about the deaths, the murders, the, the, gr the grit, the graft, the corruption going on in Flint. But there's also a lot of stuff that's underneath that that's f flourishing quite well. I mean, there's, as you, you know, you're from the Ann Arbor, but now you've been, you've been around here for a few years talking to people and going you know to there was a Flint Institute of Music. I'm not sure if that's the correct name or yeah. not. It's something, okay. And th they actually do have a harp program. So I, I know that, th that that's a very happening thing. And I know other musicians who teach there also. And um, there's the Whiting Auditorium, as you said, which has very good concerts. And there's the Flint Symphony. So I'm, yeah, I'm very familiar with it. Flint having a happening cultural scene. <laughs> See, I was talking about Anthony Burgess earlier, and um, and also his uh, his real name before he changed it for his pen, you know, his uh, nom de plume, they would say, I guess, or his pen name. Uh, he was actually um, John Burgess Wilson. <laughs> That's okay. his real name. <laughs> and so it's like, uh, but he was born and raised in Manchester, England, and Manchester is a lot like Flint. It was a, it's an industrial town, uh, nitty and gritty and dirty and grimy, and you know, a lot of you know. A lot of violence and everything else around there, and it was kind of considered a seedier town to live at at one point. Now it's like a, a cultural center. I mean, they have okay. yeah. It's all like in. My hopes is that Flint's going to become transformed to that. I mean, we're definitely see a decimation in our population. We already have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, largely just maybe people moving out for better opportunities somewhere else. But it, what's coming up with it so far that I've seen there's a lot of artistic groups out there, a lot of. Um, fine arts activities going on. People are encouraging all this stuff. Plus, the colleges are getting larger in their population. The University of Michigan, with more of an international, you know, group of students coming in. And um, Ann Arbor, I think, has probably done this in where you live at. It's like uh, people go to college here, and then afterwards they feel this kind of, oh, let's stay here, and they start up a business. They start up, a, they mm -hmm. collaborate with their classmates, the people they worked with or they like working with. They start businesses, mm -hmm. and. Uh, as a lifelong resident of Flint, that's why I like to see something happen like that here. I mean, just because it happens just 50, 60 miles down the road south of here doesn't mean it can't happen here to some degree. Yeah, I tend to think that people can create things, like even if some big company just moved out. I don't think that really has to devastate a community. I mean, of course it will in the short term, but I think people can create new businesses or artistic endeavors or company. I think people can, can start things themselves. and. Um, I know it's not easy to do that, but I think there's always hope of turning a community around, even when there's devastation. Well, I have hope in that respect, but it'll take 20, 30 years. On, and let's face it, it'll never be the glory years where people will come here and get the very high-paying jobs with ease and comfort, you know, of just mm -hmm. walking in and filling out an application. I don't think that's going to happen right. anytime soon. But with the, um, I see I'm encouraged by the farmer's market stills going on here, uh, those kind of things. Also, there's like... Um, uh, a kind of a big movement. Now, I don't know if you've seen the interview I did a few weeks ago with a guy named Russ Bedford talking about the Flint seed democracy, encouraging people to, uh, you know, raise up uh, these uh, these plants using non-hybridized -hybrid, uh, seeds or, you know, um, high overly specialized seeds, basically basic stock or stuff that was actually prevalent in that area at one time because we've lost so much in the past 20-some years, you know, the original. So that kind of stuff here, when you have just open areas, you have an urban setting that basically doesn't resemble too much of an urban setting anymore. Um, there's so much stuff you could develop around that. And mm -hmm. he, he, my grandfather told me, he wasn't like a PhD, he was a bar owner, restaurant owner. He told me you're, you're in that, the hospitality business, your people are your best asset. You can get a new French fryer, you can get a new stove, you can get new flooring, you can, you can change the decor of the place, but your people, your, your waitresses, your uh, servers, whatever you want to call them now, servers, your chefs, your cooks, those are your best asset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm realizing that more and more with my clients, that they're my best asset. I think, um, I probably shouldn't say this, I used to be a little bit of a, I mean, maybe I still am, but more of a prima donna, like I, I think um, I, I had more of a snobbish attitude and, you know, if people would call me, I, I don't know, I probably wasn't particularly friendly to my clients or... Um, you know, sometimes I thought, oh, they're just too demanding or something like that. And now I'm just so grateful that they're hiring me. And, that, you know, I, I just really am so honored to be able to be part of their events that, you know, 
I, I see things totally different from, from how I used to see things. See, I had a friend who I, who I met because um, it was at a flea market, and I saw this knife that he had made. He had made. I didn't know this guy. He just wanted the knife. So I bought the knife, and this guy um, who I bought it from was basically, he was like selling it for the, the knife maker. And so he said, well, this guy who made the knife wants to get to know you and wants to talk to you and stuff. So he gave me the number, and I called the guy. Now the guy, the, the, that knife maker, become one of my best friends. Oh, that's really Because he, that was one of his first knives he ever sold. And he was like, well, what kind of person bought my knife? <laughs> and to me, um, and he was an artist in all the ways, too, though. He was an artist. He not only made knives, he was also good at what we call the industrial arts. He was very good at uh, paint, um, drawing and sketching and the guy was basically a high school graduate. He graduated from a local school here, but he also um, had this immense thirst for knowledge. He, his library probably rivals that of any small town library, mm -hmm. his personal library, thousands of volumes, different, different subject matters, you know, history, art, metaphysics, um, occult, religion, everything he, you know, he read up on everything. And uh, he was just a very, he's a very interesting person to meet up with. But I, he was always so, but the thing is that connection we had because Basically, he was seeing me buying that knife as me believing in what he did. That's wonderful. And, and so, I mean, it's, and we've been friends for since 1984. So that's a long time. Wow. And um, I think that's what I mean. You, you, it's like you're, I, I can't help, like, when people are like, they tell us we help them out doing something, that chokes me up yet, you know, that because that kind of contact, I mean, it's like, um, I'm not a, like, I don't believe in, like, how touchy-feely business world, you've got to have those kind of decisions being made. But when you have that, you could have that, and you also have the addition of the human side of it, that actually the more positive human side of it. That is a very powerful attraction to stay in doing something like that. I think that must be that for you, too. I yeah. think so, yeah. Because let's face it, somebody like I know that you've, um, you've had people now you've got contact through being on these shows here, mm -hmm. and now uh, you work with on a kind of a regular basis. Right. And there is a, there is a friendship. There is kind of a... Business friendship, but there's a still friendship, kind of like a human connection between you and um, well, Nancy to Catch and, right. yeah, and the Caregiver Show. Yeah. And see, that's what Flint Talk Radio is about. We try to build, to get the community to realize that they're, everybody's here. And to stop seeing each other is so people you could pass by in the streets or whatever without notice. And we've got to do that at some a larger city. you definitely got to do that. But you've got to take time to see the potentials and people just by talking to them just by maybe not being so, just going by them so fast, you know, in life. That sounds kind of like 60 is shippy stuff, I know, sometimes. <laughs> Confused with myself, but, um, and I'm not, I don't ever consider myself a hippie, but there's some things that they said were, the ring true. I mean, right. they are true. I mean. Yeah, I think you have to care about what you do. It can't just be like a job, something where you're, you know, just watching the clock, hoping it'll be over or something. You know, you have to really be caring about what you do. Otherwise, you know, what's the point of anything? It's just, it just seems like you have to be, be when, there in the moment. Do it. Well, anyway, we're well, going to try to wrap this up. But um, if you want to leave us with another song, we'd really appreciate it. No. Okay, this is another Irish tune. This is Brian Boru's march. Brian Boru was a king um, around um, a thousand years ago in Ireland, around the time of the Crusades. <laughs>
wonderful song there. Um, Laura Federbush, a harpist from out of Ann, Ar uh, Ann Arbor area, and she can, be, um, she can book, be booked to reach through the Rush Entertainment. Um, it's 989-781-1553 or the Flint number 810-235-5700. And also, would you encourage people to friend you on Facebook too? Or? Oh, if they're so inclined, sure. Okay, and thank you very much again. I know your schedule is really busy and you'll be up here again in the Flint area tomorrow. Right, tomorrow? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for uh, the Tom Sumner Show, which is on WFNT yeah, 1470. And it's going to, do you know what uh, time uh, slot? From 3 to 4. Yeah. 3 to 4. So he, his show runs from 3 to 6 people. Very good show. You never know who he's going to have on because he does a show every day. He goes out and he finds all kinds of people. So if, if you haven't listened to Tom Sumner Show, definitely encourage, especially for tomorrow. But um, we definitely want to give uh, you know props up here for uh, Laurel. But um, definitely come in anytime you want to, okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.